Good evening. I'm Bob Meter, former chair of the National Association of Flight Instructors, and would like to welcome you to uh, Four Flight Workshops. And sooner or later, my camera is going to come away. There we are. There's my camera. So thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, Ryan will go over the uh, the notes and just uh, the rules in just a moment uh, because we got 1,200 people so far and still people are still joining us. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to my good friend, uh, Brian Schiff, he and I have been uh, instructing together, and he was one of my mentors when I first became a flight instructor a long time ago. And so, Brian, you've got the controls. Hey, Bob, thanks a lot. Hey, everybody, thanks for uh, joining us tonight, the second-ish episode of the Four Flight Workshops. This is uh, going to be a lot of fun. I've got a lot of positive feedback on this. How are you doing tonight, Bob? Really great. I really? see you're hanging hanging out above the sectional there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's better better than my office. Trust me. So. Speaking of better than your office, we've also got Mike Jesh with us tonight, and he's uh, joining us uh, from the land of the midnight sun. He's vacationing in uh, Iceland right now, and just been sending us some fantastic pictures. Hey, Mike, how are you? It's really midnight or one a.m. there. Hey, Brian. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay here. Yeah, uh, yes. I'm in a town called Akurairi. Aku Akurairi. Well, I appreciate you trooping in for us and, and joining tonight to help us with the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> tonight's webinar will be recorded. And uh, and if you guys see anything that, uh, you know, is, is, is sticking out in the Q&A uh, or anything else that you want to add, uh, Mike and Bob, feel free to jump in. So thanks for being here. We will record this. It'll be available on YouTube. And if for some reason the uh, Zoom account fills up, uh, it also is being streamed on YouTube. If you get dropped off of here, you can also go over to my channel, uh, The Proficient Pilot, on YouTube and, and see it live there as well. Uh, the recording will also be there. So welcome to tonight. The slides will be available. If you're an advanced user, bear with us. We're going to cover some of these things that are pretty basic. We're going to cover some things that are a little bit more advanced and some tips and tricks on top of that. The uh, recordings that we're doing here should serve as a prerequisite for each of the subsequent um, four flight workshops. So if you're here tonight on the second one, it is my <clears throat> hope that you've already seen the first one because we're going to keep building on those. But that said, it's you'll still get something out of this if you haven't seen that before. So let's jump into the PowerPoint. We are being supported by Social Flight, uh, Social Flight app. The FAA safety team, of course, this is an FAA safety team event and you are eligible for WINGS credit. You'll get that after uh, the, the webinar is over for just for attending tonight. Uh, Gold Seal Ground Schools uh, and uh, the 99s, particularly the Ventura County 99s, who we are su supporting as well. The National Association of Flight Instructors, who Bob and myself are both on the board of directors. And our new supporter this month is uh, Pivot Cases, who has for, they have uh, iPad cases and mounts. They actually provide a lot of the mounts for the airlines. The, uh, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to give away four prizes. We'll have two Gold Seal Lifetime courses. You can choose from private or instrument. Uh, we'll give away another one-year NAFI membership, which uh, not a big value, but does entitle you to a lot of discounts. Um, in fact, you get 33% discount off a of four flight. We'll be giving away a pivot pad case to fit your iPad and a suction mount to go with that. And also they're going to throw in a, a pivot t-shirt uh, that's your side, that's your size as well. If you're watching the recording, don't fear, we will continue to give away Gold Seal Ground School courses more at each subsequent uh, workshop as well. These pivot cases, I've bought one myself. Again, the airlines are using them. Um, the, they're great for general aviation. They got suction cup mounts, yoke mounts, all kinds of mounts. And you just clip it uh, onto the little square device there. And it's easy to remove by pinching the blue tab on the back. You just take it off. They've also got some leg straps that have the little square mount on them. So you can, you know, strap them to your leg, snap it onto the strap, and then you can uh, uh, take them off easily, pick it up and use it, uh, and then put it right back onto that strap. Uh, this, I've been trying a lot of different cases, and this is the one I'm liking now. Uh, and just for watching this, we have a, uh, a discount code. They were nice enough to not only donate a giveaway for us, so we'll give away at the end, but also they gave us a coupon code of FFWS. If you use that when you check out, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. 
So thank you very much to uh, Pivot Cases for that. Uh, their website is also listed below and it's in, it'll be in the, uh, on the Four Flight Workshops website as well. Again, coupon code FFWS gets you 10% off at checkout if you buy from there. So some new workshop items. We're going to, we, you know, I got a lot of people telling me disable the chat. It's very distracting, but you know, to me, this is kind of a time to be social as well. We are not going to monitor the chat because there's just way too many people, a lot of uh, conversation going on. So if you have questions, use the Q and A. That's what uh, Bob and Mike are going to be looking at. And if we see a lot of people asking uh, a certain question, we'll uh, they'll feed it to me and, and we'll answer that question. But if you put it in the chat, we're probably not going to answer it. We might put some uh, web links or advice or whatever in the chat. I decided not to disable it because I read through last month's chat and there were some people um, attending who arguably probably know a lot more about ForeFlight than I do. And I learn from them. I hope that I'm able to teach them one or two things. And I think this getting together is why I wanted to do this so I can learn from them they can learn from me we can all learn from each other and offer some things and you're going to see some of the some of the suggestions in the chat from those people and that's why I decided to keep the chat we may go to twice per month because there's a lot of data a lot of information a lot of teaching a lot to talk about once a month just doesn't seem enough uh, but I also might create some mini uh, videos that I don't want to take the time to show like how to set up an aircraft or uh, certain things. I don't want to take the time during the webinar or during the workshop. So I might create a short, you know, five minute video, how to do this or how to do that. If we get a lot of questions on a certain topic, and then we'll put them on the YouTube channel on the website as well. Everything can be linked from the fourflightworkshops.com website. Uh, also, this uh, Zoom account is is very expensive. So I can, I can only afford a cap of so many attendees. And if it goes and we hit that limit, it's pretty high. Uh, and therefore, is why is it expensive? But to go to the next step is very expensive. That's why I decided we're going to stream this as well. So if by chance we hit that limit, uh, then the attendees who try to join will automatically be given the link to go to the YouTube live stream. If you get kicked off tonight as well, you can go to the YouTube live stream. Um, the agenda for each workshop, I'm going to try to format it like this. Uh, we're going to have an intro. We're going to have questions and comments from the last workshops. We'll talk about what's new in Four Flight. Boy, we could do that almost every day. Uh, but I'm also going to show you how to find what's new because uh, it could, you know Four Flight is constantly improving and there are a lot of changes happening so often that I think it's better to rather than go over all of the changes, I'll go over the recent ones and then show you where to find them. Uh, and then we're just gonna, we're, I'm gonna talk about iPad safety on every workshop just briefly. I wanna touch base on it because I think it's important that we don't regard this as a heads down device. We just need to, to, to keep ourselves safe and keep our eyes out the windows when we're using this, this app. Today we'll stick with more um, planning a flight. So it's gonna be more toward on the ground type stuff with four flight, pre-flight planning where eventually I think two episodes or two months from now, we'll get into actually hooking it up to in-flight. We'll use X-Plane for that. We'll link it up and we'll show you what the app looks like while you're flying and how to use certain things and some tips and tricks. And then of course, at the end, we'll get into some open discussion. And then at the end of the webinar, if there's still a lot of interest, we can take some Q&A. We'll stop the recording for the official part of the workshop but hang around and informally chat about ForeFlight and answer some questions. The, again, I was saying this very expensive and some of you have donated. I really truly appreciate that. I'm not trying to make money with this. I'm at the point where, you know, I, I have a great job. I have, you, you learn, you earn, and then you return. I'm at the phase of my career where I'm enjoying returning. I've gotten very good with this app because I've used it since it came out uh, and I've studied it. Uh, but it costs a lot of money to do this. If you feel like contributing, great. If you don't, please enjoy it. You, you're, you know, we're offering it free. And, and because we're spending thousands of dollars on Zoom and equipment to bring you these free workshops, uh, while it's not required, we truly would appreciate any contributions to help defray these costs uh, by contributing. And, and we thank you for that. It doesn't improve your odds. I will say it does not improve your odds for winning any of the prizes if you do uh, contribute some some money to us. I appreciate that. If we receive more than our costs, then we will donate uh, the, the difference to an aviation uh, charity like the 99s or someone who has uh, scholarships for people learning to fly. 
So let's get to it. Your questions and comments from the last month. So I got a lot of emails, a lot of great questions and uh, during the workshop and then also afterwards. One of them, Richard R said, when I transfer my flight to Garmin GPS 175, the flight transfers, but the procedures don't transfer and I have to re-enter. What am I doing wrong? I don't think you're doing anything wrong, Richard. This is a common problem. We get a lot of people asking this question. Uh, I have yet to see the procedures transfer. Initially, I thought maybe it was because the database was out of date or the uh, some other interface problem. But generally speaking, I don't think these transfer. If anybody else has any advice on that, post, post it in the chat and, and you know we'll look for that. But I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I think that's just the way it works. Ironically, even at the airlines, when we downlink our flight plans, it gives us the whole flight plan but it doesn't give us the sit and the star. And it might just be for safety reasons so that you enter that uh, specifically and manually. Andre said, regarding the nearest altimeter alert, we were talking about that last month as well. According to Four Flight Mobile Pilot's Guide, and I encourage all of you to look at this, download it, read it. It's the best place to answer a lot of your questions. It says that the transition altitude alert uh, is the nearest altimeter alert is only displayed as part of transition altitudes triggered when you climb or descend through 18,000 feet. Well, most of us don't climb through 18,000 feet, so we're not going to get that. But uh, you can always add it as an instrument in the bottom of your display. So all the things at the bottom, your ETA, distance to next fix, all of those are customizable, which we'll talk about. And you can add the nearest altimeter setting as one of those instruments down in the uh, instrument panel boxes on the bottom of the screen. So thanks for that. So Joe said, slow down. I was trying to follow along on my iPad. Buttons were pushed so fast. I was very soon totally lost. And I apologize for that. I am going to do my reasonable best efforts to keep it slow. I am recording it so you can always go back and watch, but I don't want to use that as a crutch. I am going to go at a slow pace. Uh, and, and if Bob and Mike, if, if you guys put the safe word slow down in the, in the Q&A, uh, Bob and Mike will reach out to me and say, you're going too fast. You need to slow down. Uh, but I'm going to try my reasonable best effort to uh, go a little slower. He gave me great advice. Don't try to cover so much. The points I thought I was watching a grasshopper jumping around. So pick two or three <laughs> topics to cover in depth. So that's really what we're going to do today. We're just going to start planning a flight from A to B. If you want to start playing with your iPad, it's going to be from Santa Barbara, SBA, to Napa County, APC, and on the West Coast. So we're going to do that flight plan. We'll just start going through it, and I'm going to try and keep a steady pace. So thanks, Joe, for keeping me honest and keeping me slow. Greg said, will four flight download to the Avidyne from the iPad? Again, a, ga a casual glance at the four flight user's guide. And now we're up to 15 point uh, five, I believe, version 15.5. Uh, I found this, Floor Flight Connect is a platform that enables portable and, all, and it lists all of them here. So Garmin, UAVionics, Avidyne, Avidyne is included. So yes, Floor Flight will download to the Avidyne. Uh, MDW states, I was unable to connect last night. Look forward to watching this on YouTube. I apologize if you were one of those who couldn't get on. We had several hundred who couldn't get on. And I, I just think that's horrible. I've talked to Zoom about it. I think we've resolved the problem. We'll see what happens tonight. Uh, sorry about that. And, and he said, so far, no passcode is available on the redirected page. Unfortunately, I put the passcode banner up there and I forgot to put the passcode in it. So you can see a passcode that's blank. If you watch the YouTube video uh, and you're watching the YouTube video now, if this is after the fact, uh, I will say a passcode later. I'll be sure to get that in there more accurately. Um, ForeFlight's been my backup navigation tool for four years and I can't wait to see what I don't know. Your presentations are always helpful. Thank you, MDW, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, and we got a lot of good positive feedback like that. John says, I have a current Pro Plus with both taxi route functions selected on in settings. I find no such options. Tested it at Chicago, LA, JFK, MapView, Active. Any suggestions? Well, unfortunately, the performance subscription plan is required. Uh, you, it won't work in the Pro or the Basic. You have to have the performance plan to have the taxi feature. Also, it has to be turned on. Like a lot of the new features that they're just kind of working through and uh, are in the four flight labs section you have to have it turned on so that's in more account and four flight labs 
To access taxi route, you tap on the taxi route button on the bottom of the maps flight plan window or the top of the plates. There's a, several ways to get into everything. Uh, a lot of things I'm going to try and show different ways to access a lot of the same things. So when I show you one thing, you're going to say, oh, well, I've been doing it this way. Yeah, probably, uh, because there are many ways to skin cats in four flight. There are a lot of ways to get to things. Most of the time, they're intuitive. Sometimes uh, one way is better than another. And we'll go, we'll go over a lot of these. Gary said, you did communicate a lot of information last evening. My head is still spinning. Uh, again, I'm going to try and slow it down and keep it slow. Uh, I need to learn and embrace a process of some type so I can remember the various four flight symbology and control functions, allowing me to get the most out of your workshop. You might suggest a way to do this in your next workshop. I think that's a fantastic suggestion and you're absolutely right because it is tough. The symbology and the buttonology is the toughest part of this. What I'm going to do as a method to try to make it easier for you is use the correct terminology. So for starters, let's take this opportunity to look at some of the common buttons and symbols that you see in ForeFlight. The first one, whenever you see a star like that, it's the favorites. So if I say save it to your favorites or add it to your favorites, you simply tap on the star and when it turns from white to yellow, you've added it to your favorites. This one below it here is the box with the arrow coming up out of it. That's going to be a send to button. And I'm going to refer to that a lot because a lot of times we're going to do a lot of sending to. We might look at a chart and want to send it to the map. We might look at our four flight flight plan and want to send it to an email to somebody, or we might want to send something to a printer. So when I refer to this button, it's the send to button. It's that box with the up arrow coming out of it. The map layers bar right here when you tap on that that obviously opens the uh, menu layers the menu of layers of the things that you can have up here on your map when i refer to the flight plan drawer and it's a drawer because it appears to slide out like a drawer from the top of your screen that's where most of the heart of this app is is in that flight plan drawer uh, so we'll be working a lot in there and i'll refer to that i'll say go to the flight plan drawer and you hit this fpl button and that will open up that little drawer with the flight planning window in it this little gear here is looks like a quick settings gear. It looks like a gear. It is the quick settings button. So when you tap on the quick settings gear, you get a menu of commonly used settings for where you happen to be in ForeFlight. You can go into the global settings part of ForeFlight by going into more and settings, and you've got them all there. For example, this one that I'm showing is at the top of the map page. So when you tap on this, uh, quick settings gear, you're going to get a lot of frequently accessed settings for the map. So again, quick settings gear is, is what that is. If you have synthetic vision, this button here turns it on. That's the synthetic vision button and you, that opens and closes. So if you see a synthetic vision or half of your iPad is uh, screen is filled with what looks like a, a cartoon of, of where you are with the ground and the sky and obstacles, this button may have been inadvertently pressed. You can press it again to deactivate it. When these are active, they turn blue. This button here looks like an instrument is for the instrument panel. And that's what I referred to earlier at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of the iPad on the map page is the instrument panel. Sometimes it's in the way. It's that bar at the bottom that shows you your ground speed, your distance to the next waypoint. A lot of different things it can tell you, including the nearest altimeter setting, like I'd mentioned a little bit earlier. It can be modified and you can put a whole host of things on there. Again, that's another thing that we'll talk about, but that's the instrument panel button. So this shows and hides the instrument button, the instrument panel from the bottom of the flight plan from the map page. I'm sorry. This button here is the favorites and recents. So the star is favorites. It's a com it's combining two features, the favorites and the recents. So it's a clock kind of showing you points in time, time being historical. That's where you get your recent things that you've looked at or recent things that you've searched for. We're going to see some of that as well. Two more that I think are worth talking about. This top one here looks like a pencil drawing. That's the annotate button. If you want to draw on a chart or on a plate, or on a map, you can tap on that and it turns on the annotation tool where you can choose the colors, the thickness, uh, the shapes and all kinds of things that you can draw and annotate or highlight on the charts and plates and maps and even documents. This one here is the last best for last is the zoom to root button. You're going to hear me refer to that a lot. And every time I push it or tap on it, 
I'll say I'm going to tap on the zoom to root. It's on the left side of the map page. What that does is it exactly sizes your map to fit the route that you've selected. You'll see that when we work on it. So you don't have to sit there and pinch and zoom to try to fit your route exactly. You want to see your whole route at once and let it fill as much of the page as it can. Tap on the zoom to route button. It sets the size and the zoom perfectly for your flight plan. So Gary said, you mentioned the safety concern that looking inside the cockpit compromises looking out the windshield for traffic. Totally agree, but my hope was and still is that maybe we can use ADSB in link to see proximate traffic and reduce the need to look out. I'm going to, while I share that, that would be fun. And I, I envision us having windowless airplanes and we're just looking at synthetic views of everything. The problem is the airplanes that you see on the ADSB in and the uh, synthetic vision, those airplanes you see are there, but so are the ones that you don't see. Not everybody has ADS-B out and not all the aircraft are displayed. And I just want to encourage everybody for now, at least, we just need to keep our eyes out the window most of the time. If you look down to do a task on ForeFlight while you're flying, make it brief and look back up. So do it in steps. And the way we're going to plan our flights is such that we're going to get as much of the stuff done ahead of time and then set the iPad so that it's usable in flight in such a way that we don't have to keep our heads down for a long time changing settings. John said, four flight offers three plan levels. So what percentage of the audience have the basic level? It would be good to do a poll to see how many have the basic pro and performance. It's good to know your audience. I totally agree. That's why I, it took so long to start doing webinars as I'm sitting here by myself and I, I enjoy interacting with people. I, I feed off of you guys and I, I can see when you're falling asleep when I need to make it interesting or, or when I need to do something different or if I'm talking about something and nobody's getting it. Uh, then I, I can tell that. Well, as we're sitting here, I just don't know my audience too well. So let's do a poll. Let's see. And Mike, if you could launch poll six, um, you know, which floor four flight plan do you have? Let's see what you guys have and we'll see what I need to cover. And just because you might not have a plan, then it doesn't mean I don't need to cover it. Like if nobody has a performance plan, I still want you to know what's available should you get it. So I'm going to take a sip of coffee while you guys are answering this one. I know coffee, you're thinking I'm going to be up all night. It is evening here. And I apologize to you East Coast people who, or anybody east of that, who, this is very late. Um, and Mike <laughs> being in Iceland as well. It's unfortunate. I had training at the airline. I had no way around changing my schedule. So I do apologize. We'll get back to doing it earlier and maybe we'll even consider starting the, the webinar uh, one hour before our original scheduled time. Looks like we've got pretty much everybody answered and I think we've got a pretty good mix. It looks like if I share the results, um, I hope you can see them now. It looks like 24% uh, have the basic. I ignore the word plus because it's on every plan. I don't like to say extra words. Although those of you watching this might argue with me on that. The pro plan, 40%, and the performance, 31%. So most people have the pro and performance. It's pretty evenly split with, I'd say, most of you having the pro. It's a good compromise. I am going to point out some things in the performance plan, though, as well. So uh, good to see that. All right. Now I know my audience. It's pretty well split. Let's see. A YouTube viewer told me that 64 gigabytes is more than enough for iPad size for most all G, most two all GA pilots. Unless you're flying the entire United States and preloading every single chart, FAA document and approach, you'll never exceed 20 gigabytes usage. Never once came close to using over 64 gigabytes on the iPad I use for aviation exclusively. Um, yeah, so I appreciate that. That's true. 64 will probably work. It depends. It depends on what you have on your iPad. Uh, maybe you bring movies with you. Maybe you have other stuff on it. Maybe you have work things. Uh, I happen to like downloading the entire US with every chart and every plate. I also have a Jeppesen subscription. So that's got two of every plate and chart because of the Jeppesen and the government. And it takes up quite a bit of space. So I'm going to show you that in a second. A big note about cellular iPads. The GPS chip in them is not WAS, obviously, <laughs> and less accurate than external devices such as the Sentry. Much better to use an external GPS receiver. I totally agree with that. Uh, I would have one and let the internal device be uh, a backup. So 
I think last I think the reason he mentioned that is because last month I said you should get the cellular version so that you'll have a GPS. Well, if you get an external device, you don't need to have the internal GPS. So that's that's absolutely true. You can save some money on that and, and then have an external device, which also gets um, receives traffic and weather as, as an ADSB in. He suggested that an iPad mini six. 64 gigabyte Wi-Fi plus the Sentry is the best buy for aviation iPad currently. I think he's right. That's a good, you know, punch for the price. And I would agree with that. Just so you know, I have right now everything on my iPad. I have the uh, entire U.S., Canada, Mexico, including Alaska and Hawaii. I have Jeppesen. I have everything. I have a lot of four flight documents. I have a lot of FAA documents and a lot of my own documents. And four flight is using about 52 gigabytes of memory. Now, when an update comes on one of my iPads, my work iPad that I use at my real job, it, uh, it doesn't have enough memory on it. It's got, I think, 32 gigs. And when an update, database update comes, I can't download it because there's not enough room uh, because it tries to keep the, the new update and the current version of the charts on board. So you can have, so it'll automatically switch over and be ready for you. If you're running into that problem, don't download the updates if you don't have enough memory until that date. If you uh, need to, you can actually, sometimes it won't download the update because it wants to overlap them. What you can do is delete the entire database of everything you have on your iPad and then re-download the next one. That's one way to get around that. But having the two terabyte memory, I don't worry about any of that. I carry movies and everything and I just keep as much as I can on board. Uh, and again, it's up to you. you. Everybody has a different taste for how much memory they want to have and how much they want to worry about managing it. Bill says, how can I put a 50 nautical mile ring around my home airport? And I thought that's a good one. You can find out where all the cross country for private and commercial, where, what airports are, are good for that. And uh, so all you got to do is just put all the points there. Just get the lat long for every 50 mile point, you know, 36 of them all. I'm just kidding. Don't get the latitude longitudes. These were calculated by four flight. Um, I had another person send in a suggestion and I did this with my home airport. Just take and do the first one, Denton. This is where uh, I rent aircraft. It's slash 360 radial slash 50 miles is one fix. And then the 005 slash 50 miles, and then the 10 degree radial and 50 miles. So you, you put each of these points in there and you eventually have this circle painted. When you paste it into four flight, it calculates the lat long of each of those points. And that's why you see those here. I've included this document on my website. You can just go to four flight workshops and download this document. And then I have the instructions in here on how to replace this airport, all of the DTO, KDTOs with your home airport. And then you can just copy and paste that right into uh, your four flight flight plan. Again, the plans, uh, I'm not gonna say plus, there's basic, pro and performance. We're going to keep these handy in case we need them because I might talk about something that you don't have. I also recommend that if you have the uh, manual, uh, I would keep the the four flight user's guide handy in your uh, uh, documents and it's actually right here. I have a PDF of it. You go to this page 30 and let's see 29 and 30 shows the plan comparison of what each plan has. And as you get down toward the end here, you start seeing the things that the performance plan has, one of which we'll talk about today. I might show you the 3D view, the uh, uh, hazard advisor, hazard advisors in the pro and performance. So we'll talk about that. Those of you with basic may not see that. So anyway, just know where to find it. It's in the uh, ForeFlight uh, user guide. Uh, this is the current one. You can also download it from uh, fourflightworkshops.com. There's a link to download this one as well. Have that in your documents. That's a, a handy one because you can look at these things up. All right, let's see. If you're a, a NAFI member, by the way, you do get the 30% discount. And these are the prices if you're a NAFI member. So what's new in ForeFlight this month? Uh, the my comments section can be edited. So any comments that you make, you can manage all of your comments in one place. You can delete them or sort them or do whatever you want to do. And that's one of the fixed, the new features that they've got. Another one is the logbook enhanced track log integration, where you can take more than one track log and put it into one logbook entry. 
the uh, logbook date search, they put a search feature in so you can actually do a date search and see what you were doing on that day. Um, the 3D engine out procedures, this is only for the performance plan. Uh, it shows like for aircraft engine out procedures, departing mountainous airspace, it shows you the procedure and the route to fly if you lose an engine. And this is on obviously for turbine aircraft, uh, higher, higher performance. If you're in a single engine, I'm going to go back. If you're in a single engine airplane and lose an engine, you're not going to fly this route. I just want to say this is for multi-engine aircraft. Uh, bulk delete track logs. Uh, I actually got a lot of questions on that, and now they've uh, come up with a way to do that. So you can actually delete, check all the track logs you want to delete and delete them at once rather than having to do them one at a time. The expanded airport operating hours, if you used to be that you didn't know if they were different, so now you can tap on it and see that each day the hours might be different. You'll see each day uh, of the operating hours of an airport. Uh, also, in case you go to Canada and South Africa, the VFR points have been added. That's another new change. And lastly, new runway analysis aircraft support. And again, that's for the performance and that's for, for jet type stuff that uh, most of us probably don't use. If you wanted to look at the changes, go to that four flight uh, user guide and look for the change history in the back. It's in the appendix and you'll see each month what the changes were. And it looks like there's about, you know, five to eight changes every month. And you can go back several months and see what the changes were. Also a great place to check and see, like we don't know if we should update our iOS. The iOS updates come so often and then, oh shoot, I don't wanna do it before a flight because I might, you know, might not be compatible with ForeFlight. So as soon as the iOS and iPad OSs come out, ForeFlight begins checking compatibility. If you subscribe to their Twitter feed or email alerts, they will tell you, hey, there's a new operating system out. We're testing in progress. We'll let you know and we'll issue the all clear. Another thing you can do is go to iPadPilotNews.com. The website is down here. There's also a link to it on my website. And it gives you this for any of the apps. Uh, which ones are compatible with uh, the current operating system. And as of right now, uh, the ForeFlight Mobile is compatible with the newest update 16.5 for the iPad. iPad safety, again, don't crash the airplane to fly the iPad. I'm going to bring this up every time. It's, it, 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 it's important to emphasize, not so important to spend a lot of time on, but please set it up ahead of time. Just be prepared for what if the airplane goes away and you lose your position? Do you have a backup for that? Um, if the screen goes blank, the battery dies. I had mine overheat the other day. Just be prepared for that. Have a backup. Don't use polarized sunglasses. You might think your iPad died when it didn't uh, or turn it 90 degrees if you're using polarized sunglasses. Don't become a child of the magenta and blindly follow the lines that you've drawn. Please keep looking out the windows. Keep practicing with the app. That's how you get good at it. My wife used to laugh at me. We'd go for a drive. We're just going to somewhere that's 20 minutes away. And I'd say, you drive. I'm going to play with ForeFlight. And I would play with ForeFlight while we're driving because I could see it moving and everything. And she would just laugh at me. But I'm getting good at it. I get to practice with it. So use it as much as you can. My favorite is X-Plane Simulator. You're going to see us in a two to three uh, workshops from now, we're gonna hook it up to X-Plane and watch it work while we're flying, but you can actually use it like you would in the airplane while you're flying the X-Plane simulator. And you can also do that with uh, uh, FSX. All right, enough of all this, let's get to actually planning a flight. Let's play with the, the iPad itself. So let me see if I can get to this screen here. Of course, my iPad didn't work. It's been sitting here too long. So I'm going to hook it up. Give me one sec. Got to mirror it, set, and here we go. So when we're using our iPad, the first thing you want to do, especially using ForeFlight, it gets a little jumpy if you have too many things open. And sometimes I've, I have students show up and it's just not working right. And I say, well, what have you got open? So I take my fingers and just swipe up from the bottom and I'm going to do that here. Whoops, missed it. And you can see all these things that are open and you can take your finger and just swipe up like that and close each one of these. Just swipe up, four flights open, but we'll reopen it. And if we keep swiping up, you can close all these. In fact, you can close two at a time with two fingers. You can, if you have three fingers, you can close. I can't do it. I'm not coordinated enough. 
three at a time. <laughs> Can't do it. One, 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 one. So you slide them all up, close them all. You've just closed all the apps that are running in the background that could destabilize ForeFlight. So let's get back to it. We'll go ahead and start ForeFlight back up again. And we got a clean start. Uh, you can see where I'm coming to you live from the DFW Metroplex. And let's go ahead and put some radar on here. This is the layers menu that I referred to. We put the radar on. We can see what's happening there. That's interesting. That's almost frightening. I don't want to see it. I'm going to turn it back off. You'll notice how when I tap that, I, I choose one thing and the menu goes away. This used to be a very frustrating thing. And, and I think Mike and I both were bombarding ForeFlight enough that they finally changed this to where you can have that menu stay. So if I turn radar on, menu goes away. I have to go back and select it. I turn traffic on and then the menu goes away and I have to go back and select it again. Well, instead of doing that, if you know you want to select multiple items, you can go to the map settings gear right here, tap on it. And these are the quick settings. And we're going to go down to a little feature called multiple selections. We turn that on. And now the, the map layers menu will remain active for as long as we want until we tap outside of it. Let's see how that works. I'll tap it. I'm going to go ahead and select all the layers I want. I'll deselect those. I'm going to turn on my VFR sectional. I'm going to put on, let's put on flight category. I can see where it's VFR, but you can see it's staying on. I'll put aeronautical charts on over top of that. So you can see that this menu stays there until I click on the outside of it. So if you're going to be doing multiple selections, that's a good idea to activate that multiple selection switch. Let's go with one at a time. I'm going to go ahead and set that back. It's at the bottom of the quick settings menu and turn that back off. Let's see. I wanted to do this in the right order, so I actually made notes. So let's say the first thing we want to do is I'm going to talk about the global search window, and that's right here. You can search for anything in there, aircraft, airports, nav aids, documents, uh, even flights, everything in that window. So let's set this how I want it. For now, I've got the menu open. I'm going to deselect flight category. By the way, this is wherever it's green is where it's VFR. Pink is bad, so red is bad, pink is bad, green is good. <laughs> it gives you a good perspective of where the weather is. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to leave the sectional on. I'll turn off the aeronautical chart. So the first thing I want to do is just type A to B in the global search window. A little bit of a shortcut hint, though. Anything you want to type in here, like let's say you wanted to search for a latitude, longitude, and you didn't know the format, or you wanted to put a radial at some distance and you didn't know the format, just click in the box in the search window, scroll all the way to the bottom, and you're going to see all the formats and it gives you ideas of what things you can search for uh, and the different things you can put in. You can search for Disney World, you can search for cities, you can search for addresses if you've downloaded that database. Or if you haven't and you're online, you can do it. So here are the formats. I thought lat long, yeah, lat long is on here. It's the second line there. You can see a lat long in there. And you can also put your end number in there. You can put all kinds of things. You can look at the, and you'll see us do that. So right now I'm just going to type the two airports we're flying to and from, and I'll put KSBA to start in Santa Barbara. And then I'm going to go to Napa County, K. A, P, C, Alpha, Papa, Charlie. And then going to the top of that, you'll see here's a route, 256 nautical miles, a direct route between those two airports. You need to put the K in there, otherwise you're just talking about a VOR. If I put SBA, if there was an SBA VOR, it would use that. So let's just go ahead and enter that. And there's what we got. There's a direct route from Santa Barbara to Napa County Airport. Now, obviously, this is probably not going to work. If I zoom into uh, this area down here near Santa Barbara, you'll see there are some big brown things <laughs> up here. They call little cumulo granite, some terrain that might be a problem, maybe even some airspace that could be a problem. So, and every time I tap on the map, we get that little window popping up. It shows me what's there. So I'll just to tell you what that is. If I tap right here on the map, this little drawer coming out from the side is showing me the airspaces, the intersections that are nearby, the waypoints, because that's what's selected. 
if I want to see the nav aids near where I tap and you can see this green circle, I can tap on the nav aids and you'll see all the nav aids nearby. If I want to see airports near where I tapped, I tap on airports and you'll see nearby airports. You also see the airspace. If you want to see everything, just click on all. And if I tap on the airspace, the Los Angeles, you know, flight information region boundary, I can tap on that and it makes it green. Well, what area is that? This is it. That's the Los Angeles center. So we're, uh, we're not going to be concerned with that right now, but I wanted you to see what that was. So that's when that keep, keeps opening. That's what that is. When you tap on a certain part of the map, it shows you what's there. So if we're looking at this, uh, I, I don't, let's go to the flight plan drawer and open it up. And here's what we've got. It put in what we've selected and searched for the Santa Barbara to Napa County. I'm going to go ahead and select the end number of the airplane I'm going to fly. You can set one as a default or select one that you're going to use. I'm going to use this 182 and here's the performance profile that I've chosen for it. Some of them come with different performance profiles. You can create your own. Cruise altitude, uh, just for giggles, I'm going to select the cruise altitude uh, advisor here. And if we look, we can select, we're going to go IFR or VFR. This plan is going to be VFR. Are we going westerly or easterly? We're going westerly. So here are the altitudes that it's going to suggest. And it's not going to suggest the plus 500 until we get 3,000 above ground. That's where the rule applies. Um, so let's just check 4,500 for now. And those of you with the pro or performance plan will have the profile view. And you can see if I click on that, well, pretty early, if I fly a direct route out of Santa Barbara to Napa, pretty early, I'm going to be striking terrain. Uh, and then you can see this hash mark area here. That's pretty much everywhere uh, past where you first hit. So we don't want to hit the terrain, at least I don't. So we're going to scroll that up. Let's just go try 8,500 feet. And that looks pretty good, except there is some terrain down here that's showing even at 8,500 feet that I'm going to hit. This is kind of hard to slide. Let me get back out of there. 8,500. You can see that I'm still hitting the terrain. Well, I don't want to go much higher than that. I want to go 8,500 feet. So let me select a different route. But another thing worth pointing out is it's looking at terrain 20 miles from the, you know, with the corridor, so 10 miles each side of the airplane. So if you click on this gear here, the settings, the quick settings for the profile view, we're going to see corridor width here. Corridor width is 20 miles, 10 miles to each side. Well, I don't want to see, I'm not concerned with terrain 10 miles away from me. Maybe I want to narrow this down to a four mile. So if it's two miles either side, then I want to be concerned with it. So I'll set it to a four mile corridor. Go back, I'll close that. I can see I still have a problem. Well, I need to go somewhere else down here. I can't just go straight out and toward these mountains. I see a nice VOR here. I'm just gonna take this route, and this is called rubber banding, and I think most of you have seen it, but some haven't. I'm gonna grab the route, and I'm gonna pull it like it's a rubber band and drop it right on top of that VOR, the Gaviota VOR, and let go. There are several things there. I have all selected on the menu, what do I want? I want Gaviota VOR. So I tap on it and boom, it adds it to my flight plan. And as we can see here, we've almost cleared the terrain. The clearance is 258 feet. First strike is 255 nautical miles into the flight. That's over here. Well, I can worry about that when I descend. We'll get to that soon. So let's go back to this part. While we're looking at the profile view, I can expand it out with using two fingers and spreading out here and tap along here and I can see what's happening. So maybe I'm going to out climb that. Maybe I'm not, but I can always keep an eye on that and visually uh, keep to the left of it over the ocean while I'm climbing out. So I'm okay with that. The other thing you can do is you can tap in here and slide your finger along and you can see where this is. You can see where it turns yellow. You can see where the air spaces are that interfere with your flight plan. This almost alone is a reason for me to go from the basic to the pro plan, just because I really like this uh, profile view advisor. You can look at what it's going to tell you about. Right now, it's airspace is turned on. We can also look at clouds. We can look at turbulence. We can look at the icing. 
Uh, right now, we may not have some icing in this area. We may not even have turbulence. But right now, I've got airspace turned on, and it's always going to tell me about terrain. It's looking two miles either side of my course, so that's okay. Um, <clears throat> let's look up near Napa now, Napa, where we saw the zoom to route. I'm going to click this zoom to route button here. You can see the whole route. And I'm going to come back up here near Napa County and take a look. And I just want to look at my airport and see, look, um, interestingly, I can see the top of the airport data block, Napa County Airport right here, but I can't see the rest of it. Where is it? Well, you'll notice this white line here that denotes the fact that there's a terminal area chart and that's what's overlaying the sectional where that information is printed. Well, how can we bring the terminal area chart or I'm sorry, the sectional to the front and hide that terminal area chart? This comes sometimes is a problem that we have with overlapping. Basically, we're looking at scans of paper maps here. And so they're all overlapping and stitched together as best they can. And by default, this is set in automatic. You can see how here the, the MOA symbol here, military operations area is thick. And then here, when we go to the um, terminal area chart for San Francisco, it takes on a little bit different look. It's more well-defined, it's crisper. Uh, that's because we're looking at the terminal area chart. So how do we fix that? Let's go to the map settings gear, the quick settings gear. We'll open that up. I'm going slowly intentionally, so I can give you time to, to do this with me if you are working on your iPad as well. Also, bear in mind, you can go back and watch this recording and see this and pause it and everything. That's why I'm recording it. About four, three or four from the bottom, you'll see something called map touch action. Select that. You'll see some choices. Right now, when the default is no action. So when we look at it, no action and, and four flight is going to do its best to guess what you should be looking at. But let's say when I tap on a chart, I want it to bring it to the front. And that's what you would select, bring map to front on the map touch action. You could bring it to front with legends and then you can see everything on the chart, even the borders. And you can see as I've selected that, I'll tap outside there to close the box. You can see we're looking at the border of that entire chart. If I zoom out a little bit, you can see now, if you're looking at a terminal area chart, it's going to transition to the sectional if you zoom out far enough. But if I slide over, oops, let me tap it again. I've selected it and I slide over. Here is the stuff you're used to seeing when you use a paper chart. And it's all right there. So if we go back to look at Napa and we tap up here to the north, so we're tapping on the sectional plate. Well, guess what? There is the data block now that we're looking at the sectional. So we're bringing different parts of the chart to the front. The uh, sectional, or if we click down here, we bring the, uh, the terminal area chart to the front. Just to give you an idea of what's happening here, if we zoom out and look at the entire United States and I select a chart wherever I click, it's gonna show you the entire chart. And these are all the charts that are stitched together to make this map. One advantage to the aeronautical chart is that you don't have to worry about that. It's all digital. And so when you zoom in, I'm going to zoom to root. You can see all the information based on how far you're zoomed in is presented to you. Now, we don't get the airport data block, and I'm not accustomed to looking at this as much as I am a sectional. We're all trained on sectional. So for now, we're just going to go back to sectional and turn off the aeronautical chart for now. But again, tap outside the terminal area chart and I can see the entire Napa data block. So that's called map touch actions. I'm going to go back and leave it on bring chart to front when I tap on it. Not with legends, those kind of get in the way, but if you want it, know that it's there. So we'll leave it like that. So we added Gaviota, but let's go back down to the, click on the zoom to root, and I'm gonna zoom in down here on the bottom and we look at, since we added Gaviota, we're now crossing this military uh, training route here at a 90 degree angle. Now, if you're gonna run across a freeway, so if I take Gaviota out of here, you'll see the angle that we were uh, crossing. If you're gonna jaywalk across the freeway, you wouldn't wanna do it at an angle like that. That really increases your exposure time. So let's 
that's another reason I like we are flying over Gaviota to avoid the terrain. Whoops. And to uh, cross that military operations area at a better angle, put Gaviota back on there. So as we come up here, I like that. Um, I like that we're crossing the, the special military airspace uh, at that angle. And also we're over the lower portion of it. It's three to 6,000 feet at this point. And if we cross over here, it goes up to 10,000 feet. So as we're cruising along here, and you can see our two mile corridor painted here, um, we'll look at our, our profile again. And, and I know this is a long one. We're already, what, nine, 50 minutes into this. I'm gonna take a break shortly and we are gonna go for probably another 45 minutes. Uh, but if we zoom this out so we can see the entire route, you can see we do have some airspace problems when we get there. Looking at this class Bravo is this blue stuff here. And I can tell if I tap on that, I can see San Francisco and it shows me right here where that airspace is, where I'm hitting it. So I wanted to start my descent before I get to that airspace. So let's get up here. And as we're looking at the Bravo airspace, let's say I want to go down, let's see, we got an 8,000 foot sector here, a 7,000 foot here, 6,000 foot sector here. I want to go down to 4,500 feet. And um, let's say I just want to start down, oh, about this far beforehand, uh, right about here, say 12 miles looks about right and it say it's going to take me 12 miles to get down to 4500 feet or whatever you calculate i just want to show you we're going to go to a point here uh let's see because we don't want to just go direct if we look at our flight plan and go to edit we see we've only got three fixes in there well why don't we add some other fixes here why don't we add the uh uh Let's see, we had Paso Robles. I, I missed one down here. Sorry about that. I'm going to zoom back to root. As we look down here, we see it looks like we are right here having a little bit of a problem <laughs> crossing that restricted airspace. So at this point, let's just put after Gaviota, the Paso Robles VOR, this PRB. And if we put our route over there, just another way to do that is to tap on Gaviota, insert after Gaviota, just tap on that. And then you can type in PRB and then insert. And that's another way to add a fix to the route, but you can see that also fixes our problem with the airspace. Gets us around the MOA, gets us around the restricted airspace as well. So, We've done that. Another thing we could do is we could have, let's say I want to take Paso Robles out. I just put my finger on the Paso Robles, touch it till it jumps up like that and swish it off the chart. And that just that you can delete one off your route like that as well. Another way to add it is to just tap near the VOR, see Paso Robles hit nav. <clears throat> so I touched on nav and then click on the Paso Robles VOR. And we've added it, but look at that. It went to the end of the flight. We don't want it there. All we got to do is drag it to where we want it. <clears throat> so being happy with that route, we can also, if you have the hazard advisor, which I believe is part of the, uh, uh, with the preview now they have is part of the, the pro and, uh, performance plan. So we can go here and turn on our hazard advisor. And this is kind of fun. You can see the terrain around you and you can set your altitude. This assumes you're at the altitude that you set right here. And it's going to show you the red for what's at or above your altitude or yellow, what's really close to your altitude or no colors. If you're really high, you won't see any. So we can hit a zoom to root and put our altitude here of 8,500 feet. And you can see what's going to be a problem. It's just another way to take a look at your route and see the terrain that is going to be a problem or not. But you can see down here, as we're departing, if we slide this down, we're showing the hazards and what altitudes. If I put 4,500 feet in there, 
you can see where the terrain is 4,500 feet. Kind of a fun tool and you can see where the terrain is. So I'm gonna turn the hazard advisor back off. And we're gonna to go to uh, look at the airspace problem we had. So I'm gonna go back to the profile and you saw we had this going on here. We, so I'm gonna add another fix here. We, we wanna go underneath this airspace, this Bravo airspace. It's showing us that portion of the airspace that is within two miles of the route that we chose. Now, of course, we could choose a different route. Click on the route, zoom to route here and, whoop, <laughs> and zoom over here and take a look at the San Francisco Bravo airspace. We could choose a different route and go all the way around it, or we could add another fix here and we'll start down before that fix. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and put, first of all, it's gonna give you some kind of altitude buffer on here. And if you look at the uh, profile settings tab and you look at the corridor, it was showing the corridor, sorry, and then uh, the corridor hazard altitudes right here. We're gonna, sh it's gonna show you where what colors it's going to show you for what altitude or how close the terrain is to you uh, and so on. And also two miles from it, any airspace that touches that two mile corridor is what's being shown on here. So I wanted to add another fix and I'm going to add uh, uh, VPBAV. I just want to add that fix in here and I think it's this one right here. So I want to put that uh, after Go back to edit. I'm going to click on the edit and we're going to put that after Paso Robles. So we're going to put that insert after Paso Robles and VPBAV. I could do that and insert it. Change my mind. I can just take it and trash it. I can take the rubber band and just drag it over to that fix and select on waypoints. And I see it right here, VPBAV. So again, several ways to skin that cat, several ways to get to that route. Looks like we've been going for about an hour and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a short break at this point, just because I feel like, um, if, you know, I've been drinking coffee to remind me uh, so much to talk about. I, I could go on all night actually, but let's take a short break and we'll come back in about uh, five minutes. Okay. So now we're back and I'm going to take a look at this and I see that I want to get underneath this class Bravo airspace. I also was told that my mic was gain was a little high. I turned it down. Hopefully this is a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> just say so in the chat and I'll turn it down some more if needed. So if I take two fingers and touch on the screen, you can measure and I'm going to measure, okay, how far before that fix of VPBAV does the Bravo start? Oh, it's approximately six miles. So I'm just going to double that. Let's say I want to put a point 12 miles before that into my flight plan and put an altitude at it. Also, I know a lot of you don't have the pro or the uh, performance plan and your student pilots just starting out. And I get that there's still a lot of here in the flight planning that applies to you. I'm just showing some extras for now, but this flight planning stuff we're going over now still applies. And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm covering things that you don't have, uh, but some people do have it, so I apologize. But anyway, I want to put a fix 12 miles before this VPBAV. By the way, VP is visual point, B is uh, the Bay Area, and AV has something to do with what the fix is. Like there's one near it called Calaboris Reservoir, and it's a VPCAL. Any event, I'm going to put a fix 12 miles prior to VPBAV. So I'm going to tap on that in my editor and you'll see a feature called a long track offset. Tap on that and it says distance before or southeast of VPBAV. And in there, I'm just going to put the number 12. It's 12 nautical miles and I'm going to insert that. Now you can see that point is put in my flight plan before VPBAV and it's a fix if I zoom out just a little bit, you'll see it a lat long right here. But wait a minute, I'm seeing all these things, this, uh, this little point here with an altitude and this point here with an altitude. I'm not concerned with that and it's kind of distracting. Is there a way to turn that off? Yes, there is. And it's because of the corridor that we've painted. So any 
terrain or obstacles that protrude into that corridor are showing up on the map. So what we can do is we can go to the profile view, take that corridor, and again, this may not apply to all of you, and I apologize, but for those of you who do, on corridor activation, tap on the word show, and just tap on hide. It'll make the corridor go away, or you can tap on automatic, and it will only show up when you have the hazard advisor on or this profile view selected. I can put it on hide or automatic. I'll leave it on automatic, and you can see if I close this profile view, it's going to go away. If I open the profile view, it comes back. I prefer to see it only when needed. So let's go back to the editor. And we see that point that we put 15 miles before VP BAV. We want to cross that at 4,500 feet. So we just tap on it and select uh, set altitude speed time. You could put the time you wanted to cross there, the altitude or what speed or anything that ATC might assign you, more for IFR, but this is VFR flight planning. I just wanna cross this at 4,500 feet. So I'm gonna tap 4,500 feet into there. You select the units, that's how many feet. In case you're flying in meters or something like that, you can change that um, and go ahead and select close. Now you're gonna see 12 before VP BAV, 4,500 feet is a fix. If you have the profile feature and you look at it, you'll see, well, look at that. We're starting down uh, 4,500 feet to 4,500 feet at that point. We'll cross at that, at that point. Another feature for all of you while you're planning your flight plan, I'm sorry, I closed that. Let's open the flight plan drawer again, go back to edit. So we picked our, we want to go around the horn here. So we're going to go down these three on this side, these three on this side. So we got the end number, we got the performance plan, generally go with the default. We've chosen a cruise altitude. If we put a time of departure in there, let's say we're going to go tomorrow at 9 a.m. So Tuesday, June 6th at 9 a.m. And don't if you click now, it means you're departing now. It'll change that. But if we close that, our time of departure is 9 a.m. tomorrow. Our forecast for time and route, these numbers here, will be based on the forecast for tomorrow. So you might see that change if you have it set for now or if you have it set for tomorrow morning. We, on this flight, happen to have a one-knot tailwind. If I go back to the altitude advisor, you'll see if I were getting the winds, it would show up in here. No results for 8,500 feet. Oh, there they go. Had to download the forecast for tomorrow, and here they are. So you can see when choosing an altitude, this might be helpful. If I go up to 10.5, we have a one knot tailwind. Uh, but you can use this to determine what your cruise speed is. That might be helpful as well. So let's close that. We put 9 a.m. tomorrow. Let's go up to procedure. This is a feature for all of us. And we're gonna do a traffic pattern into Napa. Well, how do we wanna arrive into Napa? Well, automatically, because we've got a departure time and a forecast and our iPad is online, it's showing us what the winds are gonna be at that time. The forecast best wind is runway 19. So there's an asphalt, uh, 19 right and 19 left. It looks like we've got here a 2,500 foot and a 5,900 foot. I like long runways, so let's check 19 right and it will say, okay, how do you want to enter that pattern? 45 degrees on the best side or teardrop midfield or cross midfield. I like doing a 45 degree. That's the standard way. And I think it's the safest at busy airports. So we'll select that and click add to route. Also notice it shows you your pattern altitude here, 1,036 feet, which is 1,000 AGL. Click add to route. And now we can look at our route of flight on our editor, you see 45 degrees to 19 right with the pattern altitude there. And look at our route of flight here on the map and zoom in on it, you'll see the, the pattern entry there. 45 degree left traffic for one runway 19 right. Not that you're gonna follow this and navigate via, but it gives you the actual more accurate miles when you're planning your flight, which right now is 262 ground miles. Uh, one hour, 58 minutes, and this happens to be in a Cessna 182. And the fuel that I'm going to burn, generally one knot tailwind. When you see this little suitcase with the ball note one on it, that or the ball note exclamation point, first of all, we see one error here. 
we don't like red things. So <laughs> we see errors and uh, balls. The red is bad. So let's click on the error. What is the error? Cruise lower short route. Well, it's saying that for this flight, maybe you could do a lower altitude cruise flight. I don't want to do that. So let's look at this button. This is the suitcase. What do we do with the suitcase? We pack it. This is telling us that we want to pack for the flight. So ForeFlight is missing some information to complete everything you'd need to, for this flight. And it shows you everything here that you would need to download, weather, airmen, segments, the comments for airports and FBOs, the fuel prices, airport notams, everything. You would click on pack and it will go get all that. I like to wait till I'm finished before I do that. So let's see. Uh, I got the pattern in. I got a route I'm pretty happy with. Let's go ahead and try out the send to button that I referred to before. That's right here, the box with the arrow pointing up out of it. So we're gonna send to, well, where do I wanna send this flight to? I, want, I can email it to somebody. I could send it to an instructor to look at. Um, I could send it to a logbook, a clipboard and copy it, or I could share my flight plan file with my flight instructor as well. But for our purposes right now, I wanna send it to the flights tab, which is this tab down here. And that's where we're going to go ahead and file a flight plan. So let's send it to flights. We've got a route. We've got an altitude we're happy with. Let's send it to flights. Now it takes us to the flights tab automatically, puts this flight up on top. And there's all kinds of things we can do with this. The first thing I recommend doing, first you can see a summary up on the top. Then you can look down here and see departure station, destination. Uh, we got takeoff and landing info for these two airports. Aircraft information, performance profile. Here's an overview of the route. Uh, you want to make sure it's all accurate. Well, how many people are we going to have? Oh, I'm going to have two people. Let's change that to two people on board. Average weight, 180. Haha, <laughs> not for me. Uh, let's, let, we could change that if we wanted to here and do a basic. It would start the weight and balance for us. Uh, and so on and so forth. Make sure all your numbers are accurate. Look at this FBO. Well, let's say it's our destination services let's check the fbo we have atlantic aviation to choose from and wow look at those fuel prices uh, that's going to really cut into my wine purchasing uh, dollars that uh, i went to napa for so let's just check that fbo and you can see it's atlantic aviation we could actually if we were on our cell phone looking at this we could tap on the phone and we could call them right now i'm going to cancel that we can get driving directions or we can send them an email we can start this email process and just type in, um, sorry, I moved my mic out of the way and now I can't type, and, and type an email here. Hey, going to land in three hours or tomorrow, whatever you want. You can type up this email and it's going to go to uh, Atlantic Aviation. I'll cancel that right now. So a lot you can do here. You can even submit a fuel order when you get, for when you get there set in your fuel order and send it off to them. Uh, go back to this. So there's a lot of tools in here and I haven't even touched the beginning of them. Let's just stick to flight planning for now uh, and look at all this. We've confirmed it's accurate and let's say we wanna file this flight plan. So we're gonna click at the bottom here, proceed to file and we can, we can get out of the way, proceed to file and we can see that the form type is ICAO. That's standard for now. Uh, we have to use the new ICAO forms. It's a VFR flight general aviation we've set up an aircraft already and like i said i may set up a video on how to do aircraft setup later um, call sign true airspeed you're going to file it's basically everything that's going to go into your flight plan um, one aircraft if you're doing a flight of three you could put that in there departure airport two on board so on and so forth your route of flight your cruise altitude time and route all the stuff that goes on the flight plan i'm not going to read it all uh, and go down here, the phone place name where you're going, the FBO is optional, but the pilot information is important. Uh, so this all is in the aircraft setup for the, the dinghy, the emergency information, the pilot. By the way, anytime you go through a menu on ForeFlight, I'm gonna go quickly, see the top here where it says flight plan type and then the next section is aircraft and departure. Watch how the title sticks while you're going through those. So you can kind of go to the one that you want if you're looking for one specific. The pilot information is very important to have your phone number in there. And I put in a fake number for now. Uh, put my certificate number in. Sure. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Here you go. There's my certificate number. And I'm going to go ahead and click on file. 
So it says, are you ready to file this VFR flight plan departing 13 hours from now? Yes, I am. So I'm going to file that. Air goes, it's filing my flight plan right now with uh, flight service. It's filed. I'm going to receive an email to verify that with my in my four flight email. Uh, at this point, you get a menu. You can cancel it. You can amend it if you're changing your departure time or route of flight or anything like that. Or you can go ahead once you're airborne, if you have cellular service or internet uh, capability, you can click on activate, which would open your VFR flight plan. And you can do that right before takeoff. Conversely, once you activate it, you can close your flight plan the same way, but you got to be sure you have cellular service or internet capability. So when you get into Atlantic Aviation, I would bet that they have internet. You can go in there, open this window and cancel your flight plan. You can see these buttons are here. It's filed. You can cancel, amend, or activate. I'm going to go ahead and open up this menu and cancel this one since I don't have any intention of flying this. I have to go back into training tomorrow, which was the reason I was late tonight. <laughs> so yes, I'm going to cancel that. Also, if you have notifications turned on, it'll send you notifications if anything has changed or been updated since you filed your flight plan or since you got your briefing. So that's the next thing we'd want to do is get a briefing. When I teach private pilots how to fly, I want them to call flight service, the 1-800 um, <clears throat> number for the flight service station. And, uh, and, and I said it that way because actually, as I sit here, I just totally spaced it. 1-800 WX brief. That's it. You can also use their website. Uh, it used to be that you had to have an account with them. 1-800-WX-BRIEF to make this work in ForeFlight. Now you don't. ForeFlight uses their own account to access the flight plan service and file the flight plan on your behalf. So while we're in flights, this is our flight. I'm going to click, you can click on Navlog and it'll print you up a Navlog for the flight. Uh, a lot of people often ask, can I use this for my check ride? Yes, you can. Uh, but be prepared to answer how ForeFlight comes up with all this information how it calculated your heading, an examiner is going to want to know that kind of information. Also, they can fail it. They can make it fail and you say, OK, what are you going to do now? So unless you whip out a second iPad or have a backup, another iPhone or be able to do it on paper. Uh, so be, be prepared for it to fail if you do it on a check ride. So the next step over here is briefing. We want to get our pre-flight briefing. So I'm going to tap on that and look at that. It's retrieving our entire pre-flight briefing. After I make my private pilot students listen to and write down everything that a, a, a weather briefer says, I, I let them, I show them this and I go, oh, wow, that's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> you might notice that your briefing looks a little bit different from mine. And if, it, if you do, then I will tell you how to change that. Because there are two formats of briefing. There's a PDF and an HML, and this is the HTML, sorry. So anything with the orange dot here is unread. So these are unread sections for my briefing summary is Santa Barbara to Napa, 8,500 feet in this airplane, 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow, time and route is that. And here's the route. I have 17 unread sections. What's beautiful about this briefing is it knows when you finished it. It also is on record with ForeFlight, but also it's easy to click through. So I'm looking at the surface analysis first and I get a big picture and it this is my route over here. Uh, I can see that there's no weather there right now. If I were flying over here, obviously this might be a problem. The next section is METARS, uh, which is the hourly observations, the meteorological aerodrome report. And we can see that there might be, at our time of departure, looks like some blue status. Green is good, blue is, you know, a marginal VFR. Maybe there's a marine layer over here on the coast, is my guess. So maybe if we left later, we might see that go away. We can scroll down and we can see the METARs for all of these airports, you starting with the colors. If you see all green, just stop there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you can read them there. You can also transfer these into plain language. If you don't like the aviation talk, you can come up here and click on plain text. And when you go down to the METARs, you'll see it just says it in plain English in case you're having trouble uh, interpreting them. I like my students to know how to read the aviation format. But one good way to learn is to put it in plain text, go back up here, switch it back to uh, off, and you can see the aviation format. What's good about that is you can copy an ATIS if you learn the format. It's kind of a shorthand. I like that. Next, we'll go to PyReps. And you can see you're just stepping through all of these different sections. We're in PyReps now, and we can click on each one of these and look at them. 
it shows you where it is, what kind of airplane it was and what they're reporting. But these are all the pilot reports. This is why it's, you know, this is a pilot telling you what it was like when they were there. It shows you that where it is. It's a little eyeball in the square. For example, this one happens to be moderate. Uh, location is, I'm sorry, Modesto, 210 degree radial at 35 miles uh, at 18,000 feet. It's a Boeing 737 reporting turbulence. Well, if the 737 is reporting turbulence, I might get rocked pretty good in my 182. So it looks like there are, are a bunch of reports here. I would want to look at all these. What pilots say is meaningful to me. It looks like there's a lot of pyrups along this route. And of course, next is cloud coverage. We can see, yes, in fact, there is a marine layer. This may be a problem. Looking at this, I would say that maybe we delay this flight to a little bit later. Uh, and you can see the this is a 15Z. And if I click 18Z, it's starting to burn off. And looking at the continental United States or just the Southwest, you can choose which one you want to look at. Surface weather and winds aloft. This is showing the Southwest US at 1500Z. And there's a, a legend down here, and you can kind of see what the wind speeds are and what the surface is. We can look at three hours later and see what it's going to be then as well. Next, looking at the forecasts for all these airports, these for when we're going to be there, the, the METARs we looked at were for now. Here it shows you the time you're going to be crossing there, 1600Z, and what the weather is going to be like at those times. Here we're crossing Vandenberg at 1619. So this line right here is valid on the forecast for us and so on as we go down our flight plan. If we come up down here, we'll see uh, Monterey Airport. We're going by there at 1715. And this is the line that applies because that's uh, on from the 6th at 1600Z. And you can see down here at our, our destination, we go all the way down here and see Napa forecast at 1758 is uh, to five zero at 15 knots, greater than six miles visibility, showers in the vicinity, overcast 1500. Looking at this, I'm guessing we might not be able to make a good a VFR flight, but later we might, but not with a 5,000 broken and an 8,500 cruise altitude. So anyway, this is just going through the, 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 the entire briefing. Next section is the wind chart. Uh, so you can see the winds aloft, and this is uh, 1600Z on June 6th at flight level 85, which is 8,500 feet. When you see a flight level, just add two zeros, take the FL, turn them to zeros and put them over on the other side. And that's what altitude it is. Like flight level 180, add two zeros, that's 18,000 feet. So this is painting your route. It draws your route and shows you the winds at that altitude. So you can kind of see you're going to start out with a headwind. As you progress northbound, it turns into a crosswind at that altitude. Next, you can see a vertical cross section chart, which is really kind of cool as well. And you can see what the winds are at different altitudes uh, compared to your route of flight. It's kind of handy. Also, if there's icing, it'll show you that. And here's the symbology for the icing. Obviously, there's not any of that tomorrow. There is up here if you get high enough. Next section is the winds aloft table. Again, your altitude, 8,500 feet. These are the winds aloft, and you can kind of look at them at different altitudes to maybe choose a different altitude or see what the trending is. And then last is departure notams. We get to notams. Here are the notams for the airport. Don't ever neglect the notams. They're very important. A lot of people get in trouble for not checking notams. Uh, one time I departed toward an airport, thought I'd read the notams en route. So I was reading them en route and discovered that the runway was being closed at the time of my arrival. Luckily, I read it early enough to divert somewhere else. Uh, but that's kind of the thing you'd want to find out before you left. And then, of course, destination notams, uh, en route, navigation notams, communication notams, everything is here. Uh, SVC notams, uh, you know, for automated weather, the en route airspace notams, so the airspace change. There's a lot to review, right? And the uh, regulations say you're supposed to become familiar with uh, all available information. And now that we've got iPad and ForeFlight, um, there's so much information available that it's almost impossible. By the time you get to the end of this, so it's almost time to start over again. Uh, so you'll learn how to read it, how to scan it quickly and find the things that you want. Again, a lot of notams, air traffic control center notams, uh, center airspace is sorry, K for USA, Z is for center airspace, 
LA for Los Angeles Center. Down here, you'll see we get up here. We're talking to LA Center all the way until we get to, let's just go to the end. Uh, OA is Oakland Center. So at some point we transition to Oakland Center's airspace. And then you can return to the beginning when you've got it all done. You can see zero unread sections uh, and, and look at it all over again. Once you've done that, this will be updated and you, ForeFlight will send you, hey, there have been updates to your forecast since your last briefing. And you can actually refresh it here and get new information. And it'll tell you hey, when you- Hey, Brian. Yes. We've got a couple of questions and this is sure. one that I've had myself. That okay. screen you're looking at right now with the briefing summary on the left with each of the sections there, yeah, I don't have that in my weather briefing, and I'm, I'm, we're getting a lot of questions on this too. Yeah, how do you get that format briefing? Okay, so I, I <clears throat> thought I might get that question, and I have a uh, let's see, briefing format. I saved this. You want to go to settings and look for the briefing format, and you want to change it to graphical or HTML. What you might be looking at is the PDF. So. If, let me share my screen here real quick. Actually, let me just try and do it on the iPad. So we'll go to the settings. So we're going to go to more. And then we're going to go to settings. And then there's, I'm going to try that again, more settings. And then up here in the filter window, just type in briefing. And as soon as you get to the E, you're going to see briefing format. Click on the graphical. You might see graphical. You might see PDF. What you might have selected is, gra is PDF, and it may look like that. So select graphical, HTML, that's the one I prefer and I tell my students to have, uh, and that's what it's how it's gonna look like that. Is that possibly what your issue is? It probably is, I'm trying to pull it up on mine right now, but that's <laughs> probably it. Yeah, so you know, teach a man to fish. I don't wanna teach you where all the settings are, I wanna teach you how to find them yourself. So again, go to the more, click on settings, and whatever setting you're looking for, like let's say you're giving a webinar on ForeFlight and you don't want to display your own ship so everybody can see what part of the country you're in. Uh, your, your symbol of the you are here is called your own ship. So I'm just gonna start typing that word, own ship, if I can spell it, own ship marker, look at that. I can make it a high wing, I can change it to different colors, I can change it to all these different kinds of airplanes or I can enable own ship, I can turn it off. I can say never, and then it won't show it while I'm giving the webinar, revealing my location, but I don't care. So I'm gonna go back to always. Uh, but for example, that's how you find settings. Go into the settings window, go to this filter window and type in the setting you're looking for. Yeah, and, and uh, just checking it. Yes, that was the solution. Um, and my preference has always been for the PDF because I can save that PDF document into the flights and then I can review it while I'm in flight and I don't have internet access. I like that method. Um, it, it should store your briefing on board. Have you found that not to be the case? I like saving the PDF. So I recommend saving the PDF and then switching it back to HTML for review before flight. Yeah, I'm going to have to play with that a little bit more, but you know, that's why I come to these things. I learn new stuff. <laughs> me too. And, and I'm sure that there's a lot in the chat that's going to teach me stuff when I read that later. Uh, I guarantee of, you. I'm sure. And I thank everybody for, for submitting this stuff because, uh, and maybe we should publish the chat so that everybody could see that. That might not be a bad idea. I can't speak for Mike. He's sitting in a car using an iPad or whatever to uh, respond to questions. <laughs> I'm sitting in front of a computer with two large monitors and I can't keep up with everything that's coming at us. It's a lot. <laughs> and I, like I said, I'm trying to go slow, but yet here we are at uh, 40, 90 minutes into the thing. And that's how long we were going to go. Uh, <clears throat> we've started this flight. Yeah, the, pretty... the uh, sun has already come up over here. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, that was gonna happen <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that's what happens when you're up in the North Pole. Um, this is pretty much what I wanted to cover starting a flight like this. And we're going to add to this. We're going to do more in each subsequent workshop. And like I said, I might put out some videos that, that cover other stuff. The only other thing I wanted to do is show you how to find some other fun things. Like right now, Oshkosh is coming up. And I know that, let's see what all 7,000 of you who are watching this right now want to go to Oshkosh. So you just go to uh, the documents tab. 
And then in the documents, you can see there's all these catalogs at the bottom. I, I have my drives. I have the binders that I've made. A binder is something that I've created. So these are all custom. Down here are the, the my drives that I've made. And then there's down here the drives that come with ForeFlight. You're going to see these. You won't see Jeppesen unless you subscribe to that. But if you tap on the ForeFlight binder and then go over here and scroll down to EAA AirVenture Oshkosh, 2023 notice and on the right side if you have a blue down arrow tap on that it'll download it and lo and behold here's the uh the oshkosh 2023 notice so you can see the notum for how to fly into oshkosh uh among other things we have to give sean elliott a hard time for not sinking the props on the b-17 <laughs> right right there's so i showed you the search window trip the maps the maps layer uh trick uh, there's just so many things that I could show. I'd rather answer some questions at this point. Uh, we've planned this flight. We've looked at the profile. We've filed a flight plan. We've looked at a briefing. That's the basics of it. Again, we could go so much more in depth, but at this point I would click on this pack button uh, and click pack and look at that. It's gonna download all this stuff that I need for the flight. And for those of you who don't keep all the charts and maps on board, you can see, well, it went away, but it's gonna download every chart or ever the state all let me rephrase that all of the charts and plates for the states that come within 50 miles of your route so any state touching your route or 50 miles quarter of your route is going to be downloaded when you pack like that if you don't keep them all on board uh, automatically so then you can go to the nav log when you're flying and this is where you'll see fun things while you're actually flying and this is this is while you're flying so the edit and the nav log, we've covered these buttons. Any other questions? Um, let's take a couple more on that weather briefing. If you could pull your weather briefing back up again, where uh, there's a lot of discussion about the menu doesn't look the same on other people's iPads as it's looking on yours. And there's uh, some more discussion going on about Maybe this is because the iPads are in the landscape orient or portrait land orientation instead of landscape orientation. The menus are different. It could be. If I rotate it, it does look a little bit different. It doesn't you all lost your iPad there, it looks like. Oh, I guess it won't. I wrote uh oh. Hang on, I'll get it back. I rotate I find it. Yeah, it's somewhere here. Someone stole it. Um when I rotated it to the portrait orientation, that's when that happened. So let me go back to the display arrangement. So obviously you can't do that while you're working on it. <laughs> so when I rotated it, it did look different. This is obviously the landscape version. It did look different. Uh, this menu on the side wasn't there. When I rotated it, it looked like, well, no. It looked like this black part was missing. Yeah, and then you get the uh, four flight calls it the hamburger button that shows up there and that brings up the menu. That's what works on my iPhone just here in the car. Right. So it's hiding it to give you more view while you're you're in the portrait mode. Yeah. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yep. So again, it shows you how old this briefing is, 15 minutes old. I could refresh yes. this right now. And you can see that it's retrieving a new briefing. And which I would do in the morning. You know, anything more than 24 hours out on a forecast is just a guess. You know, if I'm leaving in the morning, that's probably pretty accurate forecast for tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah. But then I would definitely check it again when I got up in the morning. Yeah, and then I usually do another check right before I take off. And, and this is a good reason to have a, a cellular data equipped iPad that you can do that right before you close the door and start the engine. I agree. And for me, it's worth it. And also being able to open and close flight plans. If you're flying IFR, and we're going to talk about that next month. We're going to go to IFR, uh, lean toward that a little bit. And what I'm going to do each month is we'll start. I wanted to go VFR, then IFR. Uh, we're already too late for that. But so next month, we'll start with uh, IFR. And, and that will actually apply quite a bit to the VFR pilots. For example, if you're just looking for a route to fly and you go back to the edit, tab on the flight planning drawer, you can click on this routes advisor, generally IFR, and ForeFlight has a very good record of about, I think they're in the 70 to 80% of cleared as filed when you use their recommended routes. 
So you could take a flight, for example, and just say, we want to go, I want to clear this flight plan, which I'll show you how to do that. You tap on clear and then clear all. Uh, let's say, oh, no, I didn't want to do that. I want to get that back. The undo button, again, I think I told about this, talked about this last month, is the history favorites button. Go over to recents, and you can see the recent one we had in here. Just tap on it, and boom, you got it back. But I'm going to clear it. And I'm just, let's say I want to type, I want to go from where I am from um, Denton, KDTO, to Little Rock, K L I T, enter. Well, there's the direct route, and you can click on this route advisor, and it gives you some different routes. Well, here's one at 11,000 feet. Uh, here's ones that, that's what AT, that's what ForeFlight recommends. Down here, you've got ATC cleared. So these were, actual ATC cleared routes. This was 8,500 feet. Uh, interestingly, I don't know why it would be at 8,500 instead of 8,000. Uh, it was a turboprop and the jet were done. Oh, look at the altitudes. This is, uh, I'm not quite sure what the 8,500 feet is. Um, yeah, that's weird that you'd have an IFR uh, ATC clearance at a VFR altitude and the wrong, uh, you know, even for a, a flight going eight odd, where it right. Be. It also says turboprop and jet flight level 210 to 370. So right. look at that as well. Here's one from 9000 to 15. Let's just tap on it and you can see it shows you the route here. And if you like that as a VFR pilot, because it's keeping you out of MOAs and restricted airspace and all that. Now, it might get you into Bravo or Charlie. So you have to watch that. So I'm going to select that route and look, it just puts it up in here and we can hit zoom to route and see where it is. And for those of you who are IFR, we can change this from a VFR sectional to a uh, US IFR low chart. Anyway, we'll talk about more IFR stuff next month, but VFR pilots can use this for finding a routing as well. Brian? Um, so we got a couple of questions on the type of data that's included in that weather briefing, back to the briefing thing. Okay. Do, do you or, or do I or does anybody have the ability to select what data is included in that briefing or does ForeFlight just include what they think everything should be there in your own briefing? Yeah, I don't know of a way to select or customize the briefing. It's going to give you a full briefing and you can choose what to look at or what not to look at. I know that the PDF version is a lot more abbreviated. I have not seen a way to customize the briefing. If I were going to look for that right away, I would look in settings and I would go up here. And if I typed B R, whoops, I'm on my computer keyboard, not my iPad, B R I E, briefing format is all we get. One thing we could do is now let me switch to my monitor here and I want to go to uh, the ForeFlight mobile user's guide. I can go while I'm looking at this PDF file. I like to use control F for find, and I'm just going to type in briefing uh, options. No, but you can see every time briefing shows up in here, well, it's 92 times. So that's going to be tough to look at, uh, but we could look at them and we could see nav log briefing file selections briefing. Um, and we could start looking at that. That's, I just want to teach people how to use this user guide. It's, it's 752 pages. So first of all, just sit down and read the whole thing. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, know how to yeah. search it. Have it on board and know how to search it. If you're in yeah. for flight, um, you know, it's in for flight. Let's go back to the iPad and go to documents. Again, we're going to look at the catalogs. We're going to go down here to for flight catalogs. And right up here at the top, we got for flight mobile pilots guide. Make sure you have that downloaded. Uh, you can click on that. I did happen to see in the Q&A that if you highlight, and you can highlight in here that it doesn't transfer to your other device. And I saw, thank you for that, whoever posted that. Um, yep. It should transfer when you get a new one though, a new version on this device. But you can search this document as well. When you hit the search window, you can search for any word. You can look at the table of contents and these arrow, if you click plates, it's going to go right there. If you click the little carrot, it's going to open that part of the table of contents, for example. So be careful when you tap on the word flight binders or the carrot next to it, 
that'll open up the different sections. And lastly, you can create your own bookmarks. Yeah. And again, I, I agree with you about teaching people how to fish rather than handing them a fish, Brian. But I'm looking very quickly in my copy of copy on my iPad. Uh, yeah. The recent chapter pretty much, I don't see anything that says, says that it can be uh, customized. Yeah, I, I don't think so yeah. either. I, I've never yeah, seen I don't think there's no distinction between an Outlook briefing and a complete briefing and a, an updated briefing. They're all the same. Um, but what I would like to point out is the FAA did put out an advisory circular about two years ago. It's AC 91-92, and it's titled Pilot's Guide to a Pre-Flight Briefing. That right. tells you everything the FAA thinks you need to know to, to brief yourself for a flight. So uh, yeah. since most of us are using for flight or something like it and not calling a briefer anymore, it'd be a good idea to study that. And I'm going to be the, kind of the, the semi-Luddite here. Uh, I like having the briefing in front of me and talking to a briefer. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, can, can I change the subject? Because this is a great question somebody asked. Sure. Um, they, John Waters said he has trouble finding hotspots. And if I could ask you to do me a favor, I'm going to walk you through what I'd like you to do. Okay. Four Flight Incorporated this, and I, this is near and dear to my heart because I'm one of the people who sat on the committee working on this. Um, go to uh, go to the airport page, please. Okay. And this is how you find the, the description of the hotspots. Go ahead and go to Lincoln, Nebraska, Lima, November Kilo. K, K, yeah, there you go. Lincoln, Lincoln Nebraska. Okay. By the way, if you wanted to save that as a favorite, you'd make that little star yellow right now. There you go. Now okay. go to the uh, okay. Now go to the airport page. The next thing you already you're already there. You're already okay. there where it says airport. Okay. Right here. Yep. Right. Now scroll down. You got four flight diagram and so on. Scroll down and look for hotspot. Hotspot right here. There you go. I tap yeah. on that. And then there's the, right to the hotspot page that describes the hotspots that are that are shown graphically on the taxi diagram. But this that's is great. This is and, this is what's there, it, and so it's showing uh, at Lincoln. Uh, it's scrolled. You've scrolled off. There we go. Hotspot one is a complex intersection of runways and taxiways, and having taxi there, yeah, it can get interesting at, at Lincoln. Uh, approach holding position on taxiway near the run-up area, and another hotspot there at. Uh, 1735 and 1836, there's a confusion risk. Yeah. The runways look similar. Okay. Yeah, so I can highlight that if I wanted to. Okay. So, like, you know, it, it's kind of an, it's, it's there and it's kind of in an obscure corner of four flight, uh, so to speak. Yeah. But it is there. It's, it's, with the airport information. I hope that uh, takes care of you, John. And that's good. I, I like that. If you look at the airport diagram by clicking airport info, you can see the hotspots, those three hotspots to which that's referring. Let me turn this annotation off uh, and go back to airport info. It's the Jeppesen. It's always a 10-9 chart. If it's the government, it's airport diagram. So I bet most people have that because it comes free with four flight. And we can look and see where they exist. You can see the three hotspots. Hotspot one is right here. And that's a mess. I can see why there'd be a hotspot there. Yep. The oblong hotspots are the runway one. So this is a runway incursion issue. Well, it's a confusion off. issue. From the, from the distance, they look, there's been a lot of problems at Lincoln with people aiming at the wrong runway. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And then the third, uh, there's two hotspot two right here. Mm -hmm. And then you can go back to the... Uh, I think it was on plates is where it was. Uh, no, it was on airport information. It was, but it opens up in plates. So three fingers, that's not working. So I'm going to go back to, look like it flashed on me, go back to airports. And if you open up the hotspot page, you see it opens up in plates. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I'm yeah. So you can, you can save that or put it in a binder. So you can create a binder for your flight by hitting the send to button. Oh no, that's how you'd print it. I'm sorry. Um, we want to put it in a binder, so I'm not seeing that right now. Anyway, what else we got? Let's see. Got to unmute here again. Uh, I know people might be wanting to get off. Why don't we do the giveaways real quick, just so people, because we've been gone long enough that I think maybe we should do that.
yeah. to Pivot Case and their website, pivotcase.com. The coupon code is also on the Four Flight Workshops website, so you can see that there. Um, give 10% off your entire order if you buy these. This so far is my favorite. The airlines are using this. Uh, trying to get my own airline to use it. I think it's one of the last who haven't signed on to that. Again, there's the website, fourflightworkshops.com. The, uh, also, uh, those of us at NAFI are going to be out in Lakeland, Florida, October 24th through 26th. Got a bunch of uh, people going to be there. A lot of great tips and techniques for teaching and seminars and webinars. Come on out and join us. Go to nafisummit2023.org and uh, come on out. Um, that's all we have tonight for the recording's going to stop now, but we're going to hang out and answer some more questions. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you on the first Monday of next month. So this is just can for the can I do one more plug for our, our favorite, uh, not-for-profit organization. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, for those of you that are student pilots or private pilots or not flight instructors, uh, NAFI is not just for flight instructors. We would really love to have your membership. Um, it's a great organization, great magazine, great content.